resellers, you have landed on episode 160 of eBay the right way. Today's date is April 10th, 2024. How are we already into mid-April? This year is just flying by. My guest today is Lisa, who wears many entrepreneurial hats. No announcements this week, so we will get right into the conversation with Lisa. Hello, listeners. Welcome back. I have Lisa with us today, and uh, Lisa reached out to me to come on the podcast, so I love that. Um, How are you doing this morning, Lisa? I'm doing well. Thank you. I hope you are. Yes, yes. We're taking it one day at a time. (laughs) Um, Where again are you located? I am in the Philly suburbs, so southeastern Pennsylvania. Okay, great. Very close Um, to Jersey, Delaware, and downtown. Busy, busy place. Yes, it is. Okay, well, um, do you want to start off with a little introduction about... um, how you got into eBay and what made you want to reach out and come on the podcast. (laughs) Sure. No, I'd love to. So I've been on eBay since 2021. I had to look that up today. I wasn't sure how long I've been on. And I joined back when I was just really like flipping Barbies, but not the vintage Barbies, the Barbies that if you remember back in the nineties and the two thousands were really like elaborate Bob Mackie and Barbie had a whole store And um, my brother had told me, oh, it's my friend is just selling all this stuff on eBay and he's making a fortune. I'm like, really? When I worked full time, but I have always, always had two jobs or a second job just to fill my time. I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't. And I did that for a little while um, and it was fine. You know, it was a little bit of extra pocket change. And then life happens. I had baby number one and then, you know, baby number two comes along and we moved and all kinds of stuff. And I had, I never closed my account. I was always on eBay. And then my mother, I would say six years ago, sent me an article about people buying and flipping things on Amazon. She's like, you love a good deal. Maybe this would work for you. Uh, Oh, I do love a good deal. Shopping clearance aisles and stuff. So one thing led to another and my husband and I started selling on Amazon. And that was fine. You know, we started with books and I know I've listen to a majority of your podcasts. And I know you've had book folks on, um, and I still sell some books, but I'm by no means an expert. Started selling books and then moved into, you are familiar, RA. We never did a little bit of OA. So retail arbitrage, online arbitrage for those who aren't familiar. And we mostly sent our product into Amazon. This was really, it allowed my husband to leave his like big box job and just do Amazon kind of on the side for a little bit of money. It wasn't making, it wasn't really making a financial difference in our life, if you will. Like it wasn't life-changing money. Okay. We didn't go buy a house or buy a car, Mm -hmm. that, but we were selling during COVID. So I sold more hair color than God should allow during COVID. Um, along with, you know, (laughs) all the other stuff, but a ton of hair color a lot of hair color. And then, you know, one thing leads to another and Amazon's a funny, it's a funny animal. Folks swear by it, but you know, it just got really funny, like the high pricing errors and the low pricing errors. And the, I mean, we had probably about $200 just worth of subscriptions for technology to modify your prices, inventory lab, all the apps for books. It it got to be a lot. And somewhere along the way, Mm I found um, YouTube, which I never really watched before because I'm just kind of an old fuddy-duddy. And I found somebody who did health and beauty reselling through, um, you know, like warehouse lots or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me see if we can kind of modify our model to sell health and beauty. And then, you know, the Amazon thing, you're gated or you send in your products and then mystically you're gated. And you're like, dude, I just sent you a thousand dollars in product that you said I could send. And now you're telling me. I know. It's in, it's infuriating, frankly. And so I would sell some on eBay and then one thing led to another. And I thought, you know what? And I watched a little bit more YouTube and became more familiar with the eBay community again. And then just gently eased in 
to eBay again, um, had never been much of a thrifter, quite honestly. I mean, I grew up in the eighties where more was more and you shopped at the, at, well, my mom worked part-time at Macy's. So of course, like that's where all my clothing came from, her employee discount, and then the discount on the clearance. And it was a really, really lovely and fun right. time. I didn't thrift. I didn't really know what that was until college. My girlfriends would thrift. I'm like, ooh, why would you want to buy used clothing? That seems so strange to me. And I'm like, well, you're a dummy because I can get Ralph Lauren for like $6 and you're the bozo that's paying 50. Um, and now I almost exclusively buy my clothing thrifted. I almost exclusively buy things for my house thrifted uh, because of eBay. And I am, I'm a convert, that's for sure. Amazon and other platforms have their place. There's no doubt about it. And amazing. It, who knows one day we could go back, but for right now, being able to find unwanted, unloved, pre-loved items and finding the right home for them with the right person in the right area of the world is such a joy, keeps it out of the landfill, certainly a sustainability functionality as well. Um, so that's kind of how we found our way. And in, in the backside of that, we also, I spilt my time between Philly and Laurel, Mississippi. We had gone on like a little getaway to Laurel. And for those you may know, I don't know, it's um, featured on HGTV, a show called Hometown. And so it's this little tiny small town of about 18,000 people in Mississippi where a couple started renovating homes to really revitalize their small town. And I thought, you know what? I would really like to go somewhere and just stroll. I'm from Atlanta originally. I want to stroll. I want to not go to a conference call. I want to not get on the phone. I want to not have an itinerary that's super full of things to do. And we fell in love with the town and there was a building and I, but no breakfast restaurant and a lack of Airbnbs. And I just looked at my husband like, Hey, the building's for sale. What do you say we buy it and convert it and put in ice cream parlor and a breakfast restaurant and Airbnbs upstairs. And he was like, okay, um, he should have told me no, but he didn't. And he's down there full time. <laughs> and I split my time between here and there. It's been a, it's been a whirlwind. So I, our business is actually split, meaning I have inventory in Philly and there's inventory in Mississippi. It makes it incredibly challenging. Uh, so we're looking forward to now we're selling that building. Um, it could take a year, but ultimately he'll come home. All the inventory will be in one location <laughs> and we'll be together consistently mm -hmm. like married couples should be. So long drawn out story, but that well, is my okay. eBay journey. Yeah. Kudos to you for doing an Airbnb. I looked into that right before COVID happened. I was thinking I need another uh, income stream and it is not by any means passive. Um, no, as no. an Airbnb customer, I prefer that the owner operator be very close by. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a situation where we rent and at the beach and, um, the owner was three hours away. The cleaning people didn't show up. We got there and everything was disgusting. They, people oh. before us had pets and it smelled mm -hmm. like urine and it was horrible. And oh. this was right um, when the beaches opened up after COVID. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we ended up cleaning it ourselves and they took some, uh, you know, gave us a refund, but it was, I didn't want to clean on my vacation. I didn't want to clean up after other people. And this woman was like, well, I'm not coming. I'm three hours away. I can't come down there and do it. And that was like a big red flag. Like th this business probably isn't for me. Cause I'm really hands-on about uh, making sure uh, customers are hundred percent satisfied and going over and above. And you can't do that if you don't live very close to the property you're renting. It's yes, so you can hire people, but it's not the same, you know, like this, they just they come, the cleaning people just didn't come. Right. And what are you going to yeah. do? So, what are you going to um, do? That you is, don't know. Not, you don't know. They didn't that's come. It's not an easy business. And Oh no. Yeah. Well, there's the restaurant. That's a lot of work. And <laughs> yeah, that and too. And yeah. And then you gotta figure labor. out, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's labor. It's an, it and is. that's even now still a problem. 
It's astounding. Um, it's, we're out it's rural. astounding. We're, we're out rural now and we're doing this home remodel and, you know, like we ordered a, a new bathtub and it took almost two weeks to get here because no, there was nobody to deliver it. They right. outsourced the delivery to smaller companies in rural areas. And sometimes it's FedEx. Sometimes it's, it's whatever the company chooses, but you know, nobody to get mad at. It's not Home Depot's fault. It's, and you know, we call the delivery company and they're like, we don't have enough drivers and it's, mm-hmm. it's on a truck ready to come to you. We just don't have enough. So how are we it's still funny. in that yeah. situation now? And Right. I just wonder, I'm like, what I asked my husband, like, what are these people doing for a living? I guess everyone's a reseller now. Like what? <laughs> because we were, we were in the business before COVID hit. Right. And we were on Amazon selling hair care. We weren't on eBay selling, you know, all the stuff from people's houses. And I know that everyone had re- a lot of folks join the reseller community during COVID uh, for a number of different reasons. Right. We were already in that community prior but I do wonder, I'm like, what are people doing for a living? It was it was not difficult to find labor prior to COVID. And now mm-hmm. it is, I can't tell you, I could probably pay $25 an hour and not find someone to cook. It is almost impossible. My husband's working seven days a week. Um, we do have a couple of folks that cook in the back for us. But, you know, if they get sick or something happens, he's worked an entire Friday all by himself. He's like an octopus. You know, doing a bunch of things and gratefully it's only breakfast. So we're only open a certain number of, t- of hours, but it's exhausting and we're not young chickadees anymore. So, you know, we're just like, you know what, this isn't, this isn't worth it because the restaurant business, even breakfast isn't as lucrative as somebody would think, you know, we own the building, which means we own paying all of the liability insurance, all everything. And it is a lot of money, way more money than anyone could imagine. So, and you have payroll taxes. Folks don't realize, they don't realize if they don't have their own employees, how expensive it is to hire someone just to pay you. I have to pay $5 a pay period or whatever it is that I pay just to get you a direct deposit. Yeah. And you probably have a CPA. Yeah. You probably have a CPA that does all that because multiple businesses, different kinds of businesses. It's, it's bananas. not something you, you want to have to figure out. And you, yeah. And then you pay buddy and right. Um, well, you mentioned that you were from Atlanta. I am. So I grew up in Marietta and I moved, you... in, I moved quite some time ago. Really? Okay. I did. I did. So I, um, so... I went to Georgia state university downtown before it was cool to go there. Me too. You did? Yeah. Yeah. I did. Where, where'd you go to high school? I went to Walton. Where did you go? Oh my God, we have a cheer. We went. I went to Peachtree in DeKalb. Oh, you County. did. Okay, so a we lot did of play y'all a few. To Peachtree, and and maybe it wasn't your Walton in high school because there's also a Walton County, but they did this cheer. Um, w a l t o n Walton Walton win win win. <laughs> I don't remember that cheer, we and we were that. about the same age, so that could have been Walton County. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, a, um, I think that I, I graduated in 84. Okay. When did so you graduate? You 88. So you're four years ahead of me. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're a little, you're a little younger than me. Um, mm-hmm. But actually my son um, graduated from KSU okay. uh, in 2019 and he works for the city of Marietta um, oh. doing their like uh, internet security and all kinds of stuff like that. So yeah. Um, I miss it yeah, every day, but I don't miss the uh, traffic. I live in- so I think that my so oh, yeah. I have two kids. My oldest is a freshman in college, and my baby's a freshman in high school. So three and a half years, really a little bit less than three and a half, right, Suzanne? So three years, we're out. Like I'm out of this Arctic tundra. I have to say goodbye to no tax on clothing, which is sad. But we're gonna go to either we'll go to our house in Mississippi full time. Or we might make a pit stop around the Athens area. I we'll have some family there. A lot of both of our families. So I married similar. Th- this whole podcast is going to be all about our lives. It's not about thrifting, but we need to we need to take a turn in a minute. Similar <laughs> story. Just to you and your husband. <laughs> um, my husband and I grew up together in the same neighborhood. 
graduated together, but never dated. And then once I went through a divorce, it is a very long story, which I won't bore you, but we reconnected. He lived in Colorado at the time. My brother lived in Colorado. I went out to visit. I'm like, who do I know? Because I'm going to be with my family for seven you know, days. And I was like, oh, let me reach out to Peter. And we connected and it's like no time had ever passed. And now we're married. And it happened relatively quickly. I love it. So very, very I love it. All, all of that to say that we both want to get back. Both of our families are in Georgia and I've been away for so long. I've been away since 9-11, like right before 9-11. And I just, I miss being able to go and just get sweet tea wherever I go. <laughs> it's little things that folks in the South take for granted. <laughs> you know, I miss that. I miss that Chick-fil-A can put on their billboard down there on Easter, God has risen or he has risen. And you best not be doing that up here. Uh-uh, no. So, and I just miss all that. I miss that. And there's there's nothing wrong with geographical differences. I just, I belong down there. So I'll, I'll get down there. But I will tell mm -hmm. you the thrifting up here is amazing. And I know you've had guests on here that have mentioned that as well. And when you go to a more rural community, your thrifting options are fewer. You had someone on a podcast fairly recently from Meridian, which is Mississippi, which is only about an hour from where I'll be. So your thrifting strategy. Yeah, I think that was, um, yeah, Diane Wells, I think. Um, she was a teacher. Mm -hmm, maybe. I can't quite remember, but I remember I'll that. Oh. that. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. thrifting strategy, um, so that we can kind of <laughs> pivot to thrifting, I go everywhere. So, you know, it's cold here about nine months out of the year. So their garage sales aren't super prevalent from, I would say, October through March, right? Do you only have a fairly small, mm -hmm. short garage sale season? So you rely, you tend to rely on thrift stores and our Goodwills up here, at least in my region, are they have pivoted to hiring someone in the back to look everything up on eBay and they price things at one third of what the eBay listed price is, not the sold price. So it's very difficult to find things at my Goodwills up here. But when we start talking about sales, I'll tell you about a few Goodwills um, or Goodwill finds in another state that were really good because they were reasonable. But um, so I rely mostly on thrift stores and estate mm -hmm. sales. And I used to do online auctions. And one auction company in particular, I'd buy lots, right? Couldn't get a lot of little things. Um, I don't specialize in any one thing. It is something that I'm considering. Um, I love all the pretty things and I love picking them up, but I don't know a lot about them. So like, I love linens. I'll pick them up. I have these beautiful white tablecloths downstairs and I know that they're well-made, but there's no tag on them. I know they're vintage, but I don't know how to describe them. Right. So there are things that slow down my business because I'm not an expert in something. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy learning about mm -hmm. things, but just taking, I want to scale up and I want to be able to replace my full time income, which will take about four times what I'm doing with eBay right now. So, in order to do that, I need to figure out a different business strategy. Um, so, all that to say, the auctions in my area have gotten, I feel like they've gotten a little bit more competitive. I used to be able to pick up like an entire table for 10 bucks. That could go to like 60 now, which that's really not going to make a lot of difference by the time I have to drive an hour to the auction house to go pick it up and bring it back. So even up here with a lot of different thrifting opportunities, I have to continually pivot right? And um, started making relationships with estate sale companies and looking at not necessarily doing clean outs, but I'm like, hey, what are you doing with the rest of your inventory before you call the clean out company? And I'm just trying to think of different strategies mm -hmm. and honing those strategies so that when we move, and I know I'll have to pivot again, just like I know you probably have to pivot moving to your new location as well. It's not the same, is it? No, but that's okay because I've been ready for a change. And mm -hmm. here we've got a good little bins, which I have not been to yet. Um, oh, I love the bins. House remodel is, that's just our focus right now. We've got multiple people here every day doing different things. And it's just, 
I'm not in that zone, but you know, I've, um, mm -hmm. I'm finding lots of things in this old farmhouse. <laughs> so I it's like, <laughs> I have ready made inventory right here. Um, and then I've been to a Goodwill and got some things and, um, pricing is different and their sale days are different. They have a thing where if you're, if you follow their, uh, they call it land of Lincoln here. Um, if you follow their Goodwill Facebook page, you get a coupon on Fridays for 20% off. And, nice. you know, it's just figuring out when the deals are and stuff. And then I've also been to a church, uh, so I'm sorry, a hospital thrift store that was really good. So okay. um, I'm getting out there little by little. It's it's not as much as I want yet, but we're we're kind of in um, transition reorganization mode right now. And it'll all be worth it. It's just um, kind of living in the middle of chaos. And <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you right. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I absolutely do. And those yeah. places will always be there, right? So if you don't go for a month, two months, three months, they'll still be there. They're not going anywhere. That's what I have to continue to tell myself. Right. I, yeah. And, and I have... I also have been trying to do things in my store that are a little bit different, or I've been trying to adhere to more of a routine. So I wake up in the morning. The first thing that I do when I get on the computer is I send out offers. I end and sell similar, like anywhere from 10 to 18 items, because I have over a thousand items in my store. And some are okay. great. And some are just horrible buys that I made from a while ago, but they're listed. And I live in a community where I can't just pop up and have a garage sale. So I'm like, all right, you know what? They're just going to stay there. They're not doing any harm. And when I want to pull them, I think what I'm going to do is bring a bunch of stuff down to Mississippi and we're just going to have a garage sale. That everything's a dollar. Just come and get it. Get all my crappy buys get all the clothing that either I can't list, don't want to list or whatever have you, trinkets, whatever I have, everything's a dollar. Just please, for the love of God, just come and shop and take it. And what isn't taken, of course, we'll donate to Salvation Army or or whatever have you down there. Um, or if it's clothing, mm -hmm. you know, shelters or, or wherever. But for now, it does no harm. Um, and then I list at night when I have time. You know, that's the only time I have time because I work full time, right? Eight to six, nine to five. You name did it. Did you did you say what your um full time job is? Did I ask you that yet? I didn't. I didn't. So I work for a healthcare navigation company as basically a health plan account manager. So I work with health plans. I know I'll, I'm a subject matter expert with health plan or health insurance, basically claims and benefits and what a claim mm -hmm. should do, how it should pay, and we advocate for members um, and liaison with health plans. So I work with health plans on a daily basis and try to get them to do what I want them to do, which isn't always super easy. Um, and that I've worked seems with challenging. <laughs> um, you have job security because healthcare is just always something's going to be there. It is. It is. It's it's interesting. Maybe. I love to have the national healthcare debate with folks. I'm like people. You don't even want to wait two days to see a specialist. Trust me when I tell you, you are not ready for national health care because you're going to be sitting there waiting for three weeks to see a specialist. You are not ready. Um, and it, the system certainly is not perfect. And there are improvements that can be made, but smarter individuals than me can figure that out. I just understand how to navigate it right now and how to advocate for myself and um, for other folks. And if you gave me what's called an explanation of benefits, I can tell you like, what happened? Like, why did this claim pay this way? If you really owe the money or you don't, sometimes mistakes are made and they're quite honestly, they're coding mistakes or they're mistakes. Sometimes the provider makes a coding mistake or the provider's um, office, not the actual provider. So they're not the enemy. They're just working within the system that they have. And if you understand how that system works, then you can navigate the system. And a lot of people don't even understand their health insurance. They just know they have a plan, but they don't really, they'd rather poke themselves in the eye with a sharp stick than really understand how it works. And I think if I could encourage anybody from a non-thrifting perspective, understand your benefits that your employer offers you. It's compensation. It's a way that you can make money work for you and your family. Most people don't understand it and don't want to because it's complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. So I've done that yeah, my entire very career, much. but- I can retire probably in about when the when my little guy goes to college and I can move to a location where it costs less money to live 
is when I can retire and then do this full time or any of my other three other things. I have, I don't have enough years to live to do everything that I want to do. It's just not possible. So. Oh, me too. <laughs> I figured that out in the last month. I'm like, um, this is a lot, you know, cha- completely changing your life, moving to a different place, um, all new people. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's going to work out fine. We're very happy we did this, but it's I'm so happy. Um, and he knows the huge adjustment for me with just going from um, suburban life to very rural life. And um, we're not far away. We're only two miles from the town. So it's not like oh, I'm okay, that's not bad. nowhere, but it is, you know, with like <laughs> internet issues, technology issues, and he's a farmer and you know, he doesn't really do technology. So I'm, we're doing the, the one thing a day challenge. Like every day we're going to either order one new piece of furniture. We're going to figure out our next project. We're going to, um, you know, combine our financial stuff. It's, it's just a yeah. lot to work through. So, um, but I can yeah, only imagine the change is good. Yeah. And the one thing a day thing, cause I have a death pile or profit pile, however you want to refer to it. That is, enormous. I love the shopping. I don't like the listing as much. Or I should say my infrastructure doesn't support listing in the most efficient manner. So I that's something that I need to work on. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So like we'll photographing clothing, it just isn't <laughs> it's just not when you look at some of these YouTubers or some of these folks that are online and they're like, look at my setup. I'm like, that's a dream setup. If I had that setup, I probably would list because you can list quicker, right? You can take your photographs quicker. You can do your listings quicker. Everything's about efficiency. Um, you know, I'm down in the basement. I'm taking something off. I'm hanging it up, taking pictures. And I'm, you know, holding up the yardstick and holding up the phone. I'm like, this is just madness. Um, so I would say I just, but I'm not making enough money to pay someone to take my photos yet. So maybe one day we'll get there. But right now, uh, right now we're not there. And um I am trying to play a game with myself that I have to list at least one to five items from my death pile every day, unless there's something going on. Like I've been sick this whole week. So frankly, I really haven't been doing a ton of that. I've just been listing newer inventory. Um, And the newer inventory is smarter buys, right? And so you can look back as you, through your journey and some of your viewers may be different. But when I first started this journey, I'm like, hey, let's get that Ralph Lauren polo. That was so dumb. So now I'm like, all right, well, I can lot those up, right? I'll lot those up. Maybe I'll sell my marketplace instead, right? And just recoup some money. If I have a mm-hmm. bunch of extra charges, I'll just lot those up into like four or five and get those. But you know, that takes time. You got to go through your inventory. You got to go through your racks. Okay, where's the extra large? Where's the small? Oh, wait, I bought a small. What was I thinking? Was I on drugs? So it really... It's why I do, it's why I consider what they call niching down, right? At least maybe into a couple of different categories, but let's be honest with ourselves. I don't know that that will ever happen, but it's something that I'm contemplating. Well, and you've realized that time is your most valuable resource. It's not finding inventory. It's how, what you do with your time. And, um, we all have 24 hours a day and it's what you do with it. And is it busy work or is it, you know, listing those hundred dollar items? Cause it takes just as long to list a $10 item as it does a hundred in most cases, unless it's like something with a lot of parts and pieces or whatever. But, um, cause it's that's so how true. I evaluate my, what's my, my listing pile. I figure when I put it in my spreadsheet, I, estimate or look up, do the research, what it's going to sell for. And then Mm -hmm. I work in descending order. The most expensive things get listed first. And then every time I add to it, I reevaluate. Some things sit in there for a while because they're a lower dollar item. Maybe they were 50 cents and they'll sell for $20. But, you know, I'm going for, I've been selling milk bottles like crazy for over a hundred dollars. These old um, dairies that don't exist anymore. You probably have some in your area too. Um, just totally. old family dairies that don't exist anymore. And these milk bottles have just been in the basement forever and the families are buying them and they're oh. like, Oh, we're, thank you so much for putting, this was my grandfather. This was my great uncle. And, um, 
now they have that piece of history and it's, I never in a million years would have dreamed that milk bottles and like the little creamer bottles and stuff from these yeah. independently owned creameries and stuff. Um, completely new product for me. Um, yeah. Cause I'm, you know, here where it's a dairy farms. So mm -hmm. um, that's the, the pivoting thing. But, um, I do want to get into some things that you've sold. That's what the listeners love is hearing about those sales. So what? Well, I will warn you, I am not very impressive. So bread and butter items. I don't think I've sold anything over like a hundred. Well, man, I don't know. Maybe I sold a couple hundred dollar item. I am not the person who found something for 50 cents and sold it for a thousand. Not yet. Anyway, maybe one day that will happen, but very consistently um, just selling things that are 10, 15 X sometimes. So I bought a pair of, this goes in the category of don't overlook Target, Opal House, linens because there were these pair of teal curtains that I loved and they had like this citron tassel on the side and I'm like well I know someone's gonna love these and I also know they're not made anymore because I'm an avid target shopper so I picked up the pair I think at a at a charity sale for like 12 bucks and I sold them for 80 and they went to Hawaii so I was like, oh God, what is the shipping going to be? But I was fine. I I might've lost 50 cents because I don't do calculated shipping. After all the years of selling product on Amazon, I don't weigh things before I ship them. I estimate how much I think they weigh. And then I just hope that it's fine. And nine times out of 10, it's fine. And I have the right shipping costs or you know, make a little bit of money after the eBay fees of 15%, right? Sometimes I'll lose money, but it's okay. To me, it all comes out in the wash. And since, to your point, time is such an asset, I don't have the 30 seconds or minute that it takes me to weigh everything. It's also not where I list either. Again, back to efficiency. Um, one Volo brand, which you may already have on your list, Suzanne, it's a Ralph Lauren shirt, but it's the label that has the R frontwards and backwards, like bumping up against the, each other, like bookends. It's, it's Ralph Lauren art okay. essentially. And I found three of these shirts in a Goodwill in North Carolina. And I think they had standard pricing. So let's just say that they were $6 a piece. They were on or around there. Um, I have sold two of the three, one sold for like 135 and the other one sold for 95. And again, maybe not super impressive to everyone else. But I'm like, if that was $6 and I can turn that into 135, I'm a happy girl. And they sold, the first one sold within minutes of me listing it. The second one I took an offer on and that took a couple of weeks. So I'm like, oh, I must have listed that other one way too low. But it's okay though, because it sold, it sold right away. Um, another one to look out for was um, Bonnie Dune brand and they were Argyle socks. It was the last day of an estate sale. They were two bucks. I think they were wool. I listed the pair of them for 40 bucks and they sold in like five minutes. And, you know, I do run comps on things, but sometimes it's tricky and, and I don't always use Terapeak. So sometimes when I'm sitting on my couch, I'm like, all right, let me, I'm just going to ballpark it and we'll see if I'm right or I'm wrong. Living on the edge over here, Suzanne in Philly. <laughs> um, another thing to look out for. <laughs> Another thing I think to look out for at estate sales in particular are, it was this belt clearly from like the seventies, you know, those leather belts that had all of the like stamped decoration on it. Basic, I'll call it a stamped leather belt where it was almost like 3d and that had a belt. I think you're it. talking about tool. tool Maybe so. Where it's, it's, um, it's indented with a special tool. Yeah, I think that's tool leather. And it's like filigree, about. like it's all different patterns and designs. Very popular in the 60s and the 70s. And it had a belt buckle attached to it. And it was a detachable belt buckle. And it was um, a letter. It was a W, which is my married last name. So I'm like, you know what? And it was a dollar. So I'm like, this belt buckle feels really nice. It's not stamped sterling. So I knew it was in sterling. But I'm like, I think this will sell. And if it doesn't, it's my last name. So no harm done. I bought that for a dollar. I took the belt buckle off. So I had the belt separate because I can sell that separately if I want to. And I listed that and sold it for $50. It was, I forget who it was made by, but it was, it had a brand on there. So 
again, not super impressive, but it's a dollar into 50. And it, I might've sold that within, it might've taken a month. It might've taken a month. Now for me, because a belt buckle is so small, I'm okay with it taking a month for the right amount of money, right? I had offers. Twenty dollars. I'm like, no, no, dude. I'm not. <laughs> I'm gonna hold out. I'm gonna wait. Um, right. Recently, I also started looking on Craigslist too, just to see if there were garage sales that weren't listed on like the traditional sites, because I know not everybody is savvy enough to do that, right? Or maybe they don't want to upload pictures and they just want to post a garage sale. So. Part of pivoting was looking there, and I saw a post on there. It was the house clean out. He didn't say it was a hoarder situation, but I figured as much. And he was just like, come get what you want for free. Like, free? All right, let me see what we got. And you know, it's a decent sign when you pull up and there's a roll off on the front yard and it's already filled with stuff. And then you cringe and you say, oh, what did they throw out that they probably thought was not valuable? Mm -hmm. Was, right? Um, And it was a hoarder situation. I got there. Other people had gone in in front of me. It was a very small home but there was also a basement. We couldn't go to the basement. So I was just kind of picking up things. I'm like, oh, what is this? What is that? What is the other? It was really kind of picked over. But in this one box, it was like some old health and beauty stuff. And it was this vintage pack of goodie barrettes that you and I wore in the 80s, the thin tortoiseshell. Yes. 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 Um, It was dated 1990. So it wasn't older than that. I paid zero for it, listed it. And it sold for 70. And I think it sold within like okay. less than a week. And I did comp them because older and, um, ones were selling for more, but these were 90. So I saw that ones around the 90s were selling for under a hundred. Um, so I priced it higher at like 89 and then took a best offer at 70 because for me, I'm like, but fine. I'm happy to take that fast nickel on the zero dollar investment. So again, like nothing. And that important. item was in. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I believe my, I believe that item was in the 2023 Bolo book. Those barrettes. Okay. Um, and because funny. we because couldn't of, figure yeah. out like other people, like why? Why are they selling why? for so much? The clasps are kind of the same. Is it? Oh, I had that. Is it the packaging? Mm-hmm. You know what? What is going on with that to make it? barrettes and they're they're not like jeweled they're not cloisonne no. they're not you know they're just, uh, a, a higher and they're not like trafari where they're costume jewelry that's hair jewelry it's like what is up with that and i could not figure it out but i, mm-hmm. I don't have to know why but i just have to know that it's a thing that's exactly right it's funny yeah. you say that because i wouldn't have known to pick those up had I not heard it somewhere in the reselling community. I don't know if it was in, because I'm in several Facebook groups, right? So I don't know if it was in a Facebook group. I don't know if it was YouTube, who knows, but I knew to pick them up because of that. And I'm so grateful to live in an age where there's so much information on the internet that we're kind of like, it's the Cliff Notes version of thrifting because back in the day, 80s, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, people didn't have the internet to like Google in something. You had to really know, you know, these antique vendors and folks that did this for a living, they had to invest hours and hours and hours of time and research and learning. And we get to kind of cheat the system and just Google in something and figure it out. And eBay pass holds. And mm-hmm. so we're really lucky to do this in an age where it's fairly easy easy to understand if something is worth picking up for your business model, right? It may not be someone else's business model, but that was worth it for me to pick up for my business model. Um, The other thing also that I thought was really interesting, same estate sale as the belt. There were little baggies of travel size um, products that you would get like at hotels. And I've just taken to kind of looking up everything. And I looked these up and I was like, no, come on. These things can't possibly sell for that much. And again, not a home run. I'm not getting rich off of this, but I paid, I think a dollar 50 for all of these travel sizes. And they, I had to write it down because I wasn't really sure what the brand was. It is a gravy, a 
agraria ver, verbena. I don't even know. I don't think that's, I don't think I'm saying it right, but the whole thing I sold for 20 bucks a dollar. Yeah. And so here's a side note on that. Um, I know that hotels are getting away from those kinds of products and doing mm -hmm. things in the dispensers. They are. So, because you can't really grab the, that and take it home with you. Like people do off the carts in the hall and the extras, you know, grabbing those things. And these events like Coachella and Burning Man and all those things where um, it's used like currency. They trade with each other or they just give it to each other as gifts. Um, I've sold some that over the years. Another thing that's happening is mission trips. People take them to give to the yeah. people they're visiting um, and helping. And um, I had one ship to Costa Rica and I thought this was so weird. And the lady's like, yeah, because we're going on a mission trip and we're shipping a bunch of stuff ahead. So we don't have to bring it on the plane. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of uses for those travel trial size things. And it may not even be because it's a great brand. Mm -hmm. It may just be because it's already packaged small. And there is a use for it. Yep. It's such good points. Like you just don't really even know why people are buying these things. I don't care, right? It doesn't matter to me, but it's interesting. If you understand root cause, right? Then you may understand the life of, because everything's so cyclical, right? You may understand the lifespan of if that item will be valuable for quite some time, meaning we're selling, or if it is only just a really short, period of time, right? Like when the Barbie movie came out, people could capitalize on their Barbie stuff. It may or may not be so popular anymore, right? Because of the very small window of time. Um, one big pickup at the same North Carolina Goodwill as the Ralph Lauren shirts were the, is it Bus Buc Busilla? Is that how you say it? Bucilla, Busilla, B-U-L-L-A. Yes. yes. So my yeah. husband found these. I was over in the clothing area and he was over in the whatnot area. And he was like, hey, honey, look at this. And I recognized the name because of the internet. I was like, where did you find that? No lie. There were like 20 or 25 of them. I said, don't even comp them. Just get them all. Bring them all over. And they were, mm -hmm. I think, like $1.99, $2.99, something like that. And we've been selling them little by little. Some oh. are 20 bucks, some are 80. But that was that was a big one. That was a big one um, for us. Anyway, again, we're not that, I have not found that thousand dollar item. It's a, it's a lot of consistent like Lennox napkin rings that are, you know, the good old, the I, the Holly with the uh, gold rim yep. set of brand new, mm -hmm. still have the tags on them at the thrift where I go. And there were four bucks and they sold for one twenty five. Relatively quickly and not at Christmas. Yeah. Time. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So that was real and not like at Christmas. Those... Time. So that it's, but it's, you know, that people are looking for those. So even though it's a good profit, I also am like, oh, these are going to go to somebody who really, really wants these at their dinner table or their grandma had them or their mom had them. And they're, you know, they're what we all talk about buying back your childhood. There are definitely things that I have bought. As a matter of fact, I was at a private pick earlier this week. And there was a whole Chester full of baby clothes. No one's picking those up, right? Who does that? I'm looking through them anyway, because I found this vintage Steelers um, two t-shirt. I'm like, well, I'm actually going to pick that up because it's super cute. Love you Steelers. It's the most adorable thing. But anyways, there was a pair of zips in there. I don't know if you had siblings and if they wore zips, they were tennis shoes. And if you saw a picture of them, you'd recognize them because they were definitely, I have younger siblings. So both my brothers wore these things and I just bought them because I was literally not even going to pay a dollar for them because I was doing a bundle deal. And I bought them so that I could take a picture and send them to my brothers. I was like, remember these guys? And they're, the baby's like, nope. And my other brother's like, oh yeah, I remember them. So sometimes it's just fun to pick things up like that so that I can own them for like a minute, send them to my mom, see if she remembers them. They don't really resell but I'm okay. I'll donate them to, you know, a church mission trip or something like that. Cause they're actually in very good condition and they're not rotted. Yeah. So they're still, they're still usable. Um, a couple of, one thing that I picked up and this is because I'm trying to learn costume jewelry. I'm trying to learn a little bit more about that. 
I know that some brands are worth more than others. I, so that much I know, but there's a pair of earrings at an estate sale and they were like a sapphire, you know, they look like eighties, like sapphire with a bunch of um, rhinestones around them, a little bit larger, like about maybe an inch. So I looked on the back and they were branded and I was like, all right, I'm going to just try to comp these real quick, just to make sure there was $6 and they, this brand comped high for what I think, right? I was like, oh, holy crap. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick these up. They were Yomaz, J-O-M-A-Z. And I hadn't heard of yes, them. Yes, I've heard of but, that. But now, right? So I had not, but I, a friend of mine did a little bit of research and she told me there was, they were a partnership then they broke apart and blah, blah, blah. But those sold for like 150. So that was, I could have held out for, I could have held out for more. I think I had them listed for like 189 or something because I couldn't find an exact comp, Suzanne. I found things that were similar. And so what I need to learn is part of the reason why I wanted to come on your show is that there are folks that come on your show that are incredibly impressive, right? They've been doing something for years. They're experts in something and they have all these amazing sales. But then a majority of us are just fine in our way. And sometimes we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we underprice something. We don't know the exact comp, but we feel like we're in the in the ballpark and that's okay. But you know, what can anyone take from this podcast to learn to say, oh, okay, she made the same mistake I am. I'm not as dopey as I think I am. And we can all do better. Um, you know, whenever I post on the Making Money Mondays, I always post a high profit item and a dud because a lot of us have had duds. So I post that because uh -huh. I'm like, I do well. And then there's things that I don't do well. And that I'm trying to get better, but know that if you're in that category, you're not alone and you're in good company because <laughs> there's those of us just, just, you know, sometimes yeah. it's slow and steady wins the race. It, um, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, KC does that too. He'll be like impressive sale and he'd be like extremely unimpressive sale right. or a fail yep. or because, you know, those, those people that post those high dollar sales, um, they also have stuff that sells for 10 bucks. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just more fun to post the big ones and be yeah. like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this sold. Um, but you know, we're, we're all on the same playing field with mm -hmm. the fails because trust me, um, everybody has, and it's like, oh God, yes, I'll take $10 for that. I'll get rid of that. I'm so sick of it. I've had it for three I years. I just did it you today. Have it. You know, yeah. I just did it today. I'm like, fine. Yeah, I'll take the money. I just want it out of inventory. It's been here so long. That's why I put, I always have offers on because I'm, I'm open because to your point, sometimes your inventory sits around for a while and you're like, it's already poly bagged. It's already in a box. I don't want to have to take it out of the box, take it out of inventory. Frankly, it's more trouble for me to do that than it is to just leave it in the cotton pick and inventory and let it go for five bucks. Fine. Get it out. Make somebody happy. Right. Maybe they'll leave a positive review. So there's residual effects that can come from low dollar sales sometimes, right? Um, just two more things that I wanted to mention. One, I was at an estate sale and there were all these maps, the old kind that you and I had to unfold and navigate around before Waze and Google Maps. Um, and they were of Montana and they were all these different regions of Montana. And I wouldn't have bought them if there was one or two, but there was 11. So I'm like, someone will buy these because they were older. They were 90s. I'm like someone who is into history or into maps or whatever. And they cost me 250 and I sold them for 35, probably within a couple of weeks. So it's the, again, those kind of bread and butter, those yep. slow and steady wins the race because my goal is my goal used to be $30 in profit every day, profit after fees, shipping, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I've increased that to 50 to a hundred. That's my goal. I'd like to get to, you know, go up from 50 to get to 75 to hundred in profit each day and then scale from there, but you got to start somewhere. Um, so these little $20 profit sales all add up, right? And when you think about it to make my goal, I only need three $20 profit sales 
to get there. And with a thousand items, I should be able to do that, right? I totally understand that other people's business models are, lady, you are wackadoodle. And why would you have a thousand items when you could just have 200 and they're all priced at two to 500 or a thousand or 1500? I just am, don't have that. And that's not a bad business model. I'd love to get there. I just don't know enough to get there. So this is my journey and kind of where I am on that. And if I've told you the most interesting item that I sold, it was a lot from that auction that I said is now too expensive. And it was from the Hoover Dam. And it was a piece of, I'll almost call it conduit. And they, and it was copper, I think. And it actually had like a pamphlet inside. And it was only about this long. So maybe three or four inches. I couldn't find anything in Terapeak or eBay. I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to put this up. And I, I'm just going to put it up for like $29.99. And it didn't occur to me that if it was copper, it was really valuable. So dummy. But I thought, all right, well, it's copper. And anyone Hoover Dam, it, it literally sold in like five minutes. So I thought, well, that was really cool and interesting. And it was in a lot that I think I paid $6 for. And there was a whole bunch of other stuff that sold from there as well. So again, probably a boneheaded mistake. If I paid for worth point or looked on Terapeak, I might've found something similar, but it's a piece of conduit from the Hoover Dam. So I'm not sure how many of those had sold, right? So I just had to kind of take a best guess and it sold in a couple minutes and net net, I probably paid 50 cents for it. So I'm okay with that, whatever multiplier that is, 20X times my money or or whatnot. So, um, but I, I, I love doing this. I'd love to do it full time. And my husband says, now he's like, I don't ever worry when you go shopping because I know you're not going to spend a lot. You may come home with a lot, but you're not going to spend a lot. So I don't ever worry. It's been a really, really fun. And I'm super appreciative well, thank of you being on your podcast. Well, thank you for coming on. I know you've got another call to get on in just a minute, so I'm going to let you go. But um, I want to thank you for having to reschedule and um, sharing everything because um, you're right. Most sellers are like us that are just trying to figure it out. There's power in numbers and we're all sticking mm -hmm. together on this podcast, learning from each other. So I really appreciate you contributing. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, instead of a trivia question today, I'm going to give you some facts because I am editing this on Monday, April 8th, which is the date of the big eclipse across the United States. And we are in an area that is pretty close to a city that's going to see totality. Carbondale, Illinois is about three hours south of us so we should get a pretty good view and believe me that's all people are talking about here <laughs> everywhere you go are the eclipse glasses and uh, some businesses are closing schools are closing it's a pretty big deal here since we're so close to a city that's going to see totality so if you have not heard enough about the eclipse you're going to hear some more now. <laughs> so just a few facts. This will be the first total solar eclipse in the continental U.S. in seven years. And I remember the last one. It occurred on August 21st, 2017 and crossed the country from Oregon to South Carolina and millions of people viewed it successfully. Before that one, you would have to go back to February 26, 1979, and it will be 20 years until the next one, which is August 23rd, 2044. So a factoid, a solar eclipse only happens at new moon. The moon has to be between the sun and the earth for a solar eclipse to occur. The only lunar phase when that happens is new moon. But solar eclipses don't happen at every new moon, of course. 
Also, eclipse totalities are different lengths. The reason that the total phases of solar eclipses vary in time is because the Earth is not always the same distance from the Sun and the Moon is not always the same distance from the Earth. So the totality time frame is different. Okay, a fun fact, everyone in the continental U.S. will see at least a partial eclipse. In fact, if you have clear skies on eclipse day, the moon will cover at least 16% of the sun's surface, and that's from Nia Bay at the northwestern tip of Washington State. And I do remember the last one and the one in 1979. We were in school and we all got to go outside and see it happen. But it was just weird. Um, it got really dark and cold. The temperature dropped. And then it got light again and it warmed up and it was just, it was just really weird. Um, but this is all about totality, meaning that not to cast a shadow on things, haha, ha, but likening a partial eclipse to a total eclipse is like comparing near death to death. I know that 16% sounds like worthy coverage, but it isn't. You won't even notice your surroundings getting dark. And it doesn't matter whether the partial eclipse above your location is 16, 56, or 96%. It only reveals the true celestial spectacle, which is called the diamond ring, the sun's glorious corona, strange colors in our sky, and seeing stars in the daytime. So it's going to be pretty cool. Okay, and the first contact is going to be in Texas. That's the first contact in the U.S. It will be at the Mexican border in Las Quintas, Fronterizas, Texas at 127 Pacific, oh, I'm sorry, Central Time. The total phase is 4 minutes and 22 seconds. The center line crosses through 15 states. So this is going to be probably the most viewed eclipse ever. Totality lasts a maximum of 4 minutes and 28 seconds. Not all areas will see that amount of totality, but that is the longest time frame that anyone will see. So this will be the most viewed eclipse ever. The attention it will get from the media causes this and the superb coverage of the highway system in our country, and the typical weather on April 8th. The vast number of people who will have access to it from large cities located near the eclipse path. So if you haven't heard enough about the eclipse, now you have. <laughs> Okay, next week, my guest is a repeat offender, everyone's favorite toy guy, Lewis in New York. He's back to update us on his adventures in toy selling. The last time Lewis joined us was August of 2022, so almost two years ago. So make sure to tune in for that episode. And thank you for spending the last hour with us. Make it a profitable and productive week on eBay. Bye, everybody.